it's Greg Brown. Grab your logbook because it's time for Flying Carpet Podcast Flight 11, Vultures Prey. Some of you know me from my long-running Flying Carpet Aviation Adventure column in a National Pilot magazine or from my popular aviation books. I'm a former National Flight Instructor of the Year and Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. I'll share more about my activities following today's episode. The Flying Carpet is a four-place single-engine Cessna 182 light airplane. In it, my wife Jean and I have long traveled the North American continent, searching behind clouds for the real America, and experiencing aerial adventures like today's all along the way. Learn more at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, and join me on social media by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet. Please consider supporting this podcast via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Thanks in advance for contributing. Okay, everyone, hop aboard the flying carpet, buckle your seatbelts, and prepare for takeoff on today's musical adventure, Vultures Prey. Clear prop. Good news, Dad. We put money down on a band bus. Now we're set for the Seattle tour. It was my son, Hannes, whose crazy acid jazz hip-hop band, Loeb, had been well-received on tours throughout the American West. Their climb to the top, however, had been hampered by geography. It's a long way to anywhere from Flagstaff, Arizona. Loeb's touring had, until now, been accomplished by car caravan. Along the way, band members Hannes, Matt, Will, Connor, Phil, Sam, and Andrew, a.k.a. DJ So, had camped or bunked with friends. This new tour bus would transport musicians and equipment in a single vehicle and provide sleeping quarters on the road. But tour buses are costly. I wondered how the college students' band could afford one. Congratulations, I replied with forced enthusiasm. What sort of bus is it? I don't know the details, Dad. Matt and Phil found it in California. The next few Loeb gigs should pay the balance and then we'll pick it up. Sounds great, Hannes. How much is this bus anyway? $2,000. For the down payment? No, for the whole bus. I was astonished. It's tough enough finding a reliable used car for $2,000, much less something to haul seven musicians plus equipment and hangers on across the country. I couldn't imagine a happy ending to this story. But such is the optimism of youth. Can the band afford to operate such a vehicle? I asked in my most diplomatic tone. After all, these are adults and they hadn't asked my opinion. Sure, we'll convert the bus to biodiesel and run it on filtered cooking oil. We're already collecting jugs of free grease from nearby restaurants. I'd seen this conversion on smaller vehicles. The exhaust smells like a deep fryer, but couldn't fathom the implications for a bus. I pictured stranded musicians begging quarts of cooking oil from roadside restaurants to fill their 80-gallon tank. Such concerns, however, were quickly displaced by memories of my own youthful bus. A much smaller 1962 Corvair van purchased unbeknownst to my parents with a high school buddy. We'd invested countless hours resuscitating the decrepit vehicle, only to hitchhike home to Chicago penniless when the engine blew near Princeton, Illinois. What was then a painful loss, however, is now a treasured memory worth at least $2,000. I resolved to squelch my skepticism while the Lobster's bus deal played out. Weeks passed and I forgot all about it. Then came a late night phone call. Hey Jean, who do we know in Barstow, California? I wondered aloud upon noting the caller ID. It turned out to be Hannes calling from a payphone. 
Hey, Dad, I need some advice. I drove Matt and Phil to Paris Valley, California to pick up the bus, and already it's broken down on our way home. Where is the bus, I asked. On the shoulder of Interstate 40. Matt stalled the bus while shifting gears and can't start it again. What's more, the seller isn't answering his phone. Where should we get help at this time of night? And what would it cost? That's a good question, I said. What kind of bus is this, anyway? It's a 61 Greyhound. I gulped, then called on my truck driver neighbor Tom for advice. Have they ever driven a big rig before, he asked, chuckling. The transmissions have no synchro. He detailed the requisite skills of double clutching and clutchless shifting. Wait until morning to request a service call, he advised. That'll run about 80 bucks. But whatever the kids do, tell them not to get it towed, because that'll cost a fortune. I shared Tom's counsel with my son and suggested he notify the California Highway Patrol of the bus's roadside whereabouts. Now, if I can just convince the guys to spring for a hotel room, said Hannes, wondering if the proud new bus owners could afford one. Guess what, I informed Jean after hanging up. The adventures of parenthood never end. After no news for two nail-biting days, I'd phoned Hannes back. To my relief, he was back in Flagstaff. Where's the bus? I asked. It's back at the cellars. We had it towed. I winced. What did that cost? Five hundred dollars, he said after a pause. We charge it to Matt's credit card. Hannes felt the breakdown might be due to his friend's lack of bus driving experience. Matt couldn't shift above second gear, he explained, meaning our maximum speed on Interstate 40 was 12 miles an hour. It was pitch dark, and here I was running interference behind the bus at night in my tiny black Toyota Echo. I thought we'd all get killed. Anyway, the seller wants $100 a month to store the bus, so we need to retrieve it immediately. I work this week and can't drive eight hours each way to pick it up. Would you fly the guys to California if we can find someone to drive the bus back? Sure, I said, but what if it breaks down again and they have no car? You could always circle the bus on its way back like a vulture, he quipped. Seriously, that's up to Matt and Phil. They're handling this. Two days later, I winged westward in the flying carpet, joined by Phil, Loeb's sax player, and Kelly, a friend of a friend. Kelly claimed truck driving experience and carried his credentials dirt under his fingernails and two small but impressively heavy toolboxes. Both young men had previously ridden in light airplanes, Phil with his dad and Kelly as a summer fly fishing guide on Alaska's Kenai Peninsula. Our cockpit brimmed with lively conversation about airplanes, the band bus, and Loeb's new album. By the time we crossed the Colorado River, I felt for these guys. Aren't you worried about getting stranded driving the bus home, I asked, noting the men's lack of luggage. I am now, said Kelly, upon learning from Bill that there'd been no pre-buy inspection by a mechanic. Departing the desert sands of eastern California, we cleared high mountains near Palm Springs and plummeted for landing at Paris Valley Airport. I radioed ahead to coordinate arrival with the field's busy skydiving operation. Parachutists swirled around the flying carpet on rollout, while twin otters in a bulbous short sky van toted additional jumpers aloft. More soon-to-be skydivers milled around the adjacent jump complex with its swimming pool restaurant and pro shop. Alongside the runway, a DC-9 airliner awaited conversion for mass parachuting. And towering over it all was a vertical wind tunnel where skydivers honed their freefall technique. The bus's seller soon arrived. A gruff man, he drove us with few words to a yard full of derelict buses. There waited Loeb's dream machine, 
a peeling and battered 45-passenger GM diesel last used as a Wyoming mine shuttle. One headlight and the spare tire cover had been victims of the recent towing fiasco, while renegade body panels flopped loosely near the engine. Inside were rows of brittle benches. The seller started the bus, backed it into the road, and brusquely walked away. Without further guidance, Kelly, Phil, and I climbed aboard. Kelly took the driver's seat, and with magnificent crunching and grinding, gingerly selected first gear. Second gear came easily, but mastering third and fourth took longer. The speedometer doesn't work, observed Kelly. Not sure about the windshield wipers either. And I wish the seller had shown me how he started this thing. Hey, where's the fuel gauge? It's back by the filler, said Phil, but I'm not sure it works. The engine ran smoothly, however, and already we were exceeding the previously attained 12 miles an hour. When Kelly answered his cell phone while still successfully negotiating gears, I felt my first glimmer of hope that these guys might actually conquer the 450 miles to Flagstaff. Back at the airport, we paused for photos in front of the skydiving wind tunnel. Then, with a lump in my throat, I waved goodbye as my young friends disappeared in a puff of diesel smoke. Homeward bound in the flying carpet, I peered down at Interstate 10, the very road Phil and Kelly would drive. My journey to Phoenix would take two hours. With luck, theirs would take eight. Periodically, I calculated their progress, assuming the bus was still running, and imagined their situation if it was not. Palm Springs would offer Haven, and many miles later, Blythe, California. But there'd be little else until reaching Phoenix. Remembering Hannes's vulture quip, I resisted the urge to circle back and look for them. Not until the 10 o'clock news that evening did our phone finally ring. Cringing, I answered. We're in Phoenix, said Phil. The bus is running fine, so we'll collect my car from the airport and continue on to Flagstaff. That would be an uphill mountainous drive on Interstate 17, but having made it this far, the old bus was nearing its new home. I went to bed worry-free. But the story wasn't over. Without a working fuel gauge, the bus apparently ran dry near midnight and coasted downhill to the Cordes Junction exit. Phil retrieved fuel in his car, but Kelly couldn't restart the vehicle until investing $50 for a mechanic to reprime the diesel engine. At 7 a.m. the next morning, the Loeb tour bus motored triumphantly into Flagstaff, 16 hours after leaving Paris, California. By supper time, band members were already tearing out seats in preparation for the big Seattle tour. These guys would need every penny to sustain the old beast through the upcoming tour, Gene and I figured. So we hosted a fundraising band bus benefit bash at a hop in Scottsdale night spot to help finance the bus's renovation. Over the next few weeks, they installed bunks and privacy curtains made by band members' girlfriends. It might be a tough road, but we never doubted the power of youthful enthusiasm in fueling a band and a bus. One way or another, we figured they'd make it. Sometimes, however, circumstances prove beyond one's control. Following weeks of interior renovation in Matt's residential driveway, band members proudly prepared to take the renovated low band bus on its triumphal first drive since arriving in Flagstaff. But when they started the engine, it burped and belched clouds of ugly black smoke. Finally, someone called a diesel mechanic, who upon examination declared that running out of fuel on I-17 had apparently disrupted engine lubrication sounding the death knell for the aging high-mileage vehicle. 
with thousands of dollars of repairs out of the question and neighbors increasingly complaining about the huge greyhound consuming Matt's driveway, the bus was a goner. I've heard varying reports as to whether it was junked, donated to a charity, or given to a friend for use as a temporary residence, but in any case it was hauled away. It seemed a sad ending at the time, but Loeb disbanded not long afterward, its members scattering to fulfilling careers both in and outside of music. As I observed earlier, some memories are worth at least $2,000. And when it comes to the band bus, I'll bet the Loebsters would agree that was true. I hope you enjoyed riding along with me today on this musical flying carpet mission. You can find photos from the trip, including, of course, the Loeb Band Bus, at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com. Please help keep this podcast going by sharing your favorite flying carpet episodes on social media and donating via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Thanks in advance for supporting the podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please check out my book of stories, Flying Carpet, The Soul of an Airplane, for which I was named Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. Also at gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, learn about my other popular aviation books, The Savvy Flight Instructor, The Turbine Pilot's Flight Manual, Job Hunting for Pilots, and You Can Fly. There, you'll also find my views from the Flying Carpet Aerial Photography, available in fine art metal prints, and my pilot achievement plaques, perfect gifts for celebrating and commemorating yours or your favorite aviator's piloting accomplishments. Finally, I invite you to follow my social media sites, most of which can be found by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet. Search GB Flying Carpet on Twitter. And consider joining my student pilot pep talk group on Facebook. Thanks for joining me on today's Flying Carpet Cockpit Adventure. Music by Hannes Brown. See you next time.